Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Randy Fraden, and, and I work for BlackRock. Uh, I'm very excited to be here, closing out Cassandra Summit 2015. Uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to see that some people had enough stamina to sit through one more session before hitting the road. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, I'm going to spend a few minutes giving some background on myself and, and BlackRock and a little bit of our history with Cassandra. And then the main topic of the presentation is going to be multi-tenancy in Cassandra and how we approach it at BlackRock. Uh, a bit of background about myself. Uh, I'm a developer in BlackRock's Aladdin core systems team. Uh, I'll, I'll explain what Aladdin means in, in a couple slides. But basically, my team builds scalable storage, compute, and messaging systems uh, for a variety of applications at BlackRock. I joined the firm in 2009. And, and I've been using Cassandra since 2011. For those of you who aren't familiar with BlackRock, uh, we're the world's largest uh, investment manager. Uh, we manage over $4.7 trillion in investments. Uh, we're, we're the world's largest issuer of exchange-traded funds with our iShares platform. Uh, so hopefully a few of you own some iShares or some, some BlackRock mutual funds. If, if your money is just sitting under a mattress, you should come talk to me after this presentation. Uh, we're also, we also have an advisory business that works with governments and central banks around the world. And on top of all that, we're a technology provider. The technology that we provide is called Aladdin, and it's BlackRock's enterprise investment system. Uh, it covers all asset classes and all parts of the investment management process. Everything from trade and order management to, to risk management and portfolio administration, accounting, oversight, so, so all parts of the process. Uh, it's used by BlackRock, and we also sell it as a service to over 50 other large financial institutions around the world. In aggregate, it's used to manage over $15 trillion in investments. Our software business alone earned us nearly $500 million in revenue last year, so it's certainly no small part of what we do. Uh, BlackRock started looking, at, uh, started looking at using Cassandra in Aladdin back in 2010, when Cassandra was on version 0 0.6. Uh, for those of you who, who weren't using it back then, it, it was sort of a bumpy ride. Uh, luckily, we stuck with it anyway and, and got our first production application using Cassandra in 2011. On, on version 0.8. Uh, by now, it's used abundantly across uh, all sorts of parts of Aladdin. Uh, you can see from the chart I, I put on the, on the slide here that the daily read and write operation counts uh, across our clusters has been growing uh, steadily over the last few years and just recently crossed uh, 2 billion in aggregate. We, we use it for all kinds of things. Uh, we use it as an object database or an object cache for things like reports and models and projections and you know, reference data from the market. Uh, we, we use it as a time series database a lot. Obviously, Cassandra is very good at that um, for event logs and workflow updates. And it's the backing store for our durable message bus. Um, we especially like Cassandra's flexible cross data center support. That, that was a big reason why we decided to start using it in the first place. Uh, we, uh, there, there was a gentleman in this room earlier today from PagerDuty who talked about their unique use case of using it synchronously across the WAN. We actually do that too, so I guess there's at least two companies doing that. Um, but I'm not here today to talk about specific applications that we have on Cassandra. Instead, uh, the topic of this presentation is how we approach multi-tenancy. First, I'm going to go over, in an in, in abstract sense, what do I mean by multi-tenancy and what requirements uh, do we have of a multi-tenant storage system? Uh, and then I'll go over the different options for, for doing multi-tenancy in Cassandra. Uh, and then finally, I'll talk about our requirements in Aladdin and what choices we made and, and why we made them. I've drawn here a simple illustration of a multi-tenant storage system. So on the left, you have uh, your different applications running independently and serving different subsets of users. And then on the right, you have the, the data stored by those tenants, uh, which is also independent, but stored using shared database infrastructure. Sharing the infrastructure gives you economies of scale. 
Uh, so rather than having the cost and complexity of having to, to manage many independent sets of infrastructure, you can just deploy and manage a single pool of capacity. So what requirements would you have of this kind of multi-tenant uh, database system? One of them is, is administrative needs. You, for one, you're going to want to be able to customize the uh, configuration of each tenant's storage. So in the case of Cassandra, that might mean things like replication or, or compaction strategies or compression settings. Uh, each tenant might also have different requirements for backup, how often to take backups, what to do with them, how long to keep them for. You're also going to want to be able to track metrics and attribute load in your cluster or your, your database system so you can really understand who's driving utilization uh, to, to accurately project your future capacity needs and, and if need be, see if, if someone is misbehaving and have the ability to dial down an individual tenant. Our next, re our next requirement is security. This consists of two parts. The first is authentication, meaning knowing who's connecting to the system and being able to correlate all the activity that takes place with some verified identity. And then the second part is authorization, meaning using the information that you get from the authentication system to enforce a, a policy dictating what, what users are allowed to do once they connect. These two parts together allow you to guarantee to tenants that, that their data remains private and safe from tampering by other tenants. And our third requirement is for performance isolation. Uh, the goal here is that a spike in utilization from one tenant should ideally have no impact uh, on any other tenant's level of service. So the guy in the middle here might have thought he, he was uh, living in an isolated system until uh, the day his, his neighbors really jacked up their utilization, and now he probably wishes he'd rent in space in someone else's database. So what are our options for deploying Cassandra in a multi-tenant model? Well, the first option is just deploy a separate cluster for every one of your tenants. The advantage of this approach is that uh, it should be pretty trivial to meet our, our requirements of multi-tenant administration and security and performance isolation because we've essentially completely separated all the tenants. But the disadvantage is uh, the cost and complexity and, and overhead of having to administer and manage that many uh, clusters in your organization. Uh, essentially, you, you might not be getting many of the benefits of multi-tenancy with this approach. Uh, and the, to, the degree to which really depends on your exact infrastructure and, and how streamlined your Cassandra operations are. So I've drawn a simple illustration of how this might look in practice. Let's say you have three tenants, and they're all interested in storing the same class of, of data, in this case, prices from the market. You'd end up having three independent tables stored in three completely different Cassandra clusters. Our, section, our second uh, option is to uh, put those tenants into shared clusters, but separate them by key space. One advantage of this approach is that we should still be able to meet most of our multi-tenant administrative needs. Although a lot of configuration in Cassandra is at the cluster level via the things you'd put into your cassandra.yaml file, a lot can be customized uh, per key space or per table using the options that you specify when, when you create the key space or the table. Additionally, a lot of the control, the commands you run via node tool, so like snapshot or um, repair, those kinds of things can be done per table as well. And a lot of the metrics that, that Cassandra gives you are, are per table. Uh, so it seems like we, we might be covered with administration. And additionally, Cassandra's authorization features are, are per table. So it, it looks like we can meet our security needs. The tricky part here is going to be uh, meeting our isolation uh, needs. That's somewhat challenging to do once you, once you start to introduce shared clusters. I'm going to address that concern a little later. Uh, I've extended my example prices table to this option, so you can see at the bottom. Now you have still two independent tables, but this time stored in the same cluster, but in tenant-specific key spaces. The third option is to share your clusters, share your key spaces, but separate your tenants by table. Turns out there's very little substantive difference between this and option two. Uh, almost all that granular configuration and uh, control and metrics 
are, are actually at the table level, not the key space level anyway. In fact, one of the only things that you do control per key space is uh, your replication factor. So again, the example at the bottom shows how this is nearly identical to option two. It's just now the two tenants, different tables are in the same key space and have uh, tenant specific table identifiers. Our fourth option is to share clusters, key spaces, and tables between tenants. Now why would we do this? It seems like it would make meeting all of our, our multi-tenancy requirements more difficult, and, and you'd be right. But one reason you might want to consider doing this is that you can accommodate more tenants this way. You see, it turns out a Cassandra cluster uh, can only support having so many tables in it. Uh, we've been told maybe a few thousand will work, may, perhaps up to 10,000. In fact, if you go on the internet, a lot of people will tell you, don't, don't go beyond the hundreds. And that's not a limit that you can expand by uh, adding more nodes to your cluster, unlike uh, the amount of data you can store, the amount of operations per second you can push through Cassandra. You can't increase the table limit by adding nodes to the cluster. And the reason for that is that each table takes up a certain amount of memory in every single node in your Cassandra cluster. Some of that is variable cost based on the, the amount of data per node, but some of it is fixed cost as well. Now, this has been getting better for a while. Uh, in general, storing things off heap is, is cheaper on the, just on the amount of work the node has to do than on heap, so as they've moved more data structures in Cassandra off the Java heap, uh, Bloom filters in version 1.2, now in 2.1, you can optionally put your mem tables off heap. That's probably increased the table limit a bit. And there, there's even advanced options, you know, if you dig into the bowels to change how Cassandra's memory allocation works. So for example, the fixed one megabyte slab allocator it has for each mem table, you can dig in and, and try, to, try to work around that and, and squeeze more tables out of your cluster. But the bottom line is that you can either become an expert in all these extremely advanced options and really stray from the beaten path uh, or you can first evaluate whether you really need that many tables in your cluster. So let's evaluate uh, our, our needs for Aladdin uh, in light of those um, different options for doing multi-tenancy in Cassandra. The first question to ask is, who are our tenants? There's actually two dimensions to this in Aladdin. One is the different applications that we have. These are different components of Aladdin, you know, things related to trading or risk management or securities, et cetera, requiring hundreds of different classes of data to be stored. Now, not all of that is in Cassandra. We have other uh, database solutions as well, but a pretty sizable chunk of it is, and, and it's been growing uh, for a few years now. And then the second dimension is the different Aladdin clients. Now I mentioned that Aladdin is delivered as a service to teams both at BlackRock and 50 other, uh, over 50 other companies around the world, and even that number has been growing. Each of those clients' installation is hosted on BlackRock's internal cloud, so we're hosting all the software infrastructure and the Cassandra infrastructure, everything, for all of those clients. So with the, the simple little picture I put on the slide, you can see how the total number of tenants explodes when each client has its own installation of each Aladdin application. So let's evaluate our options for Cassandra uh, multi-tenancy in, in light of those requirements for Aladdin. The first option, just deploying a separate cluster for everything, is technically feasible, but again, this is a potentially very costly solution in terms of complexity and operational overhead. You know, Admittedly, this is probably how a lot of companies do their Cassandra multi-tenancy. This is pretty frequent advice you'd get if you go, again, search around on the internet and ask people what they're doing. They'll just say, you know, put everything in a different cluster. Uh, but, but we think we have some unique requirements for Aladdin, and we, we wanted to see if we could do better. So options two or three, sharing our cluster but putting things in different key spaces or different tables, seems pretty attractive. But when we run the numbers between hundreds of different classes of data and, and hundreds of clients, uh, we, we easily have over 10,000 tenants by that definition, uh, too many to, to put them all in one cluster and just uh, give them all their own tables or key spaces. 
And we could potentially work around that by mixing this with option one a bit, maybe sharding things somehow uh, so we have different multi-tenant clusters. But then we start to lose some of the benefits um, of, of multi-tenancy again. And depending on how we shard things, we might create a brittle situation where we still don't have much room for growth in, in one dimension or the other. So option four, finding a way to share tables, seems pretty attractive now, if we can make it work. This requires co-hosting different tenants' data in the same Cassandra tables. Though, since data modeling in Cassandra is per table, we would like to still have a distinct table per, per data class. Otherwise, we'd have to resort to techniques like generic or overloaded columns that get used for different purposes in different contexts and generally make things very confusing. Uh, but even so, this brings our required number of tables down into the hundreds if we can co-host our clients' data in the same tables. So let's see how this would look from a data modeling perspective. At the top of the slide here, I've copied again this prices table example uh, as if we had chosen option three. We were going to give every, every client its own uh, prices table. So you see the client name, client X, is uh, part of the table identifier, and presumably there's, uh, you know, 100 some odd more tables just like this in the same cluster, but with different table names. Contrast that with the bottom of the slide where I put the shared table approach. Now client is a field in the table, and additionally, I've added it to the primary key, and specifically the partitioning part of the primary key. So now I have different clients' data stored in the same table, uh, but separated by partition. Excuse me. That was pretty easy, right? I guess it's multi-tenant now. Everything's working. Can probably wrap up early and just hit the road. <laughs> uh, but you know, hang on. We had those requirements, right? So maybe we should review them again and, and just see if we're covered. The first one was administrative needs. So I mentioned that, uh, that a lot of the administrative stuff you'd want to do in Cassandra, you can do at the table level. But now we've put different tenants into the same table. So this approach really only works if you're OK with, with giving some of that uh, per tenant control up, um, which for us, we're grouping things by application. And it turns out most of the configuration and control we want to do is at the application level anyway. Now, that's not all administration. We would like to still be able to track metrics and attribute utilization at the, at the per tenant level. And I'm going to address uh, how, how we did that in a few slides. But first, I'd, I'd really like to talk about our second requirement, which was security. Now, we had a requirement that one client's data should be inaccessible from another client's applications just because of the way we've architected Aladdin. That's the requirement that, that we've made for ourselves. So let's see what Cassandra is able to do out of the box with security and, and see if it covers our use case. <coughs> I've mentioned that there's two parts to security, authentication and authorization. And it turns out that Cassandra has a plug-in system for, for both of these things. The, the I authenticator and the I authorizer are the names of the interfaces you can implement to, to do authentication and authorization. And these have been supported uh, since early on, since Cassandra 0.7. Uh, but they really got a major overhaul in version 1.2. And you know, by now, they've been overhauled to, to maturity. Uh, security is a first-class citizen in, in Cassandra. And Cassandra ships with out-of-the-box implementations of these plugins, so you don't have to write your own. Uh, and those implementations will store your users and permissions in Cassandra itself. And there's CQL syntax to manage your users and grant or revoke permissions. So it seems like Cassandra has awesome security support, but is it what we need in this case? Well, for authentication, it turns out it is. We, we didn't care so much about the built-in implementation, but we wrote our own iAuthenticator that plugs in very nicely to, to the existing Aladdin authentication systems. Um, so we're able to know at all times who's, who's connecting to our clusters and, and verify those identities. On the authorization side, not so much. You see, on each request, Cassandra will tell your iAuthorizer who made the request and which table they asked for. Our iAuthorizer needs to know who made the request, 
which table they asked for and which partitions in the table they asked for, because that's the level that we're separating our client's data by. So we changed Cassandra to make it do just that. I put uh, a diagram on this slide illustrating how Cassandra's security works. Uh, I won't call this high level. It's not exactly low level, somewhere in the middle. Uh, just explaining how it works and, and the change that we made. So on the left, you have uh, a client application process running in client X's uh, Aladdin environment. And on the right, you have uh, a Cassandra server running in our multi-tenant Cassandra environment. And the application over here in step one is making a request, which in this case is select star from, again, our example prices table, where client equals client X and market equals US and, and ticker equals BLK. Uh, it's talking to our Aladdin Cassandra library, which is really just the, the data stacks library with some, some extras that we use tacked onto it, one of them being the authentication. So step two, our library is uh, connecting to the Cassandra server and logging in with a client X specific credential. Step three, the Cassandra server driver is getting that credential and passing it through to our authenticator, which uh, in step four is verifying the authenticity of that credential and returning an authenticated identity to Cassandra. So in step five, Cassandra is gonna store uh, that identity in the, the session context, which is tied to the TCP socket going back to the specific client process saying, remember, this is user at client X. So our, our server is telling the client, OK, good to go. You've logged in. Uh, so in step six, the, uh, the application is free to actually send the request uh, to the server. In step seven, the Cassandra server driver is passing that session's authenticated identity, the table that they requested, and with our change, the partition key that was requested to uh, our authorizer. So in step eight, we look at the requested partition key, see that, OK, client X is embedded in that partition key. We look at the authenticated identity. Client X is embedded in, in the identity. Um, this this uh, application is, is an owner of the data that they're requesting. So yes, this is authorized. You are good to go. So in step nine, Cassandra can actually complete the request. This is where most of the work happens. Not much work has happened before now. And then it'll get the data and send it back to uh, the, the application process in step 10. Note that steps two through five are only happening the first time the application opens the connection to that Cassandra server. Uh, it's steps six through 10 that happen every time the, the client makes a request. So in this way, we've prevented one client from being able to see or modify data belonging to another client even though their data is stored in the same uh, Cassandra table. A little bit more about how we actually implemented this change. Uh, in the old days, this was done through uh, changes to the thrift server-side code, so we, using the interfaces and, and the settings that you see here. Uh, nowadays, it's done through our own custom CQL3 query handler. So a uh, little known feature, but using the, the VM argument on the slide here, you can actually override the custom handler that, that Cassandra uses to process queries. So our handler will intercept, select, insert, update, delete, and batch statements, and resolve the partition keys associated with those requests uh, and pass them to the authorizer. Note that this limits ordinary user access in this cluster to requests where you actually know the partition keys up front. So that's not every request you can make to Cassandra. Uh, it, it is every mutation request you can make to Cassandra, but it's only selects that are based on the primary key of your table. So for example, uh, if you were doing a token range scan or just scanning all the data in a table, uh, a regular tenant wouldn't be able to do that with this solution. That would be limited to, to super users since we don't know the partition keys before the request is processed. Our last requirement was for performance isolation. Remember, this means that a spike in utilization from one tenant uh, should not have any impact on other tenants' level of service. Turns out this is actually pretty challenging to do in a Cassandra cluster. It's definitely possible for a misbehaving client application to monopolize resources in your cluster. And 
you know, frankly, Cassandra has pretty limited tools to prevent this from happening. Uh, so, so let's look at how we, how we try to mitigate this despite that. The first thing that we do is, is uh, keep our tenants accountable. This means understanding at all times, in real time, who's driving utilization in the system so that we can identify if, if someone is misbehaving and uh, if need be, try to dial it down or in emergency, shut something off uh, until the situation can be remedied. So we use two sources of information to do this. The first source of information is the metrics that Cassandra itself publishes via JMX, many of them also available uh, through, through node tool commands. Uh, so these are per node metrics, and many of them are per table metrics uh, as well. So I put an example of uh, a visualization that we use on this slide from one of our in-house monitoring tools derived from those uh, metrics. So what this graph is showing is uh, what is the average percent utilization of the read thread pool in our Cassandra clusters broken down by table in real time. We collect this by, by taking the, the running total uh, read latency published by Cassandra via JMX, uh, which is per table, and, and just doing some arithmetic on it and saying how much time is the, the, re the read thread pool spending out of all of its available time on each table in the cluster. And this turns out, uh, just anecdotally, that, that metric alone turns out to be an awesome way to find out who is monopolizing the resources in, in your cluster, more so than who's sending the most requests, because this is really weighting that number by how expensive are each of those requests. So I highly recommend, if you're not using that metric, that, that you go ahead and do that. But this is not enough for us, because this is only broken down per table, and, and we're putting different tenants in the same table. And we, we also want to, you know, we, we want to know, even within a table, which client is driving utilization. So our second source of metrics is instrumentation that we put into the client side to also publish in real time at the per client process level uh, uh, finer grain metrics like end to end latency, uh, that's true end to end latency, not just the coordinator metric that Cassandra gives you, uh, number of timeouts, the actual number of bytes that are being written to Cassandra or read from Cassandra. So that really gives us down all the way to the, the finest grain level uh, what's driving utilization in our clusters. Uh, the, other, the other thing to do, it, it seems kind of obvious, but stay ahead of your capacity needs. Make sure that you have plenty of buffer to absorb bursts in utilization. Uh, you know, estimate up front what you need, but also be sure that you're looking on a frequent and regular basis what's actually, uh, you know, what the actual growth in utilization is and how close you think you're getting. Also, if you do observe any performance anomalies in your cluster, be, be sure to track down the cause of those anomalies, even if they're not big problems yet. In my experience, a small anomaly this week in like two weeks becomes uh, a disaster. So, so don't let that pass without looking into it. These techniques have served us pretty well. Um, but I think Cassandra still has some room for improvement in this space. Uh, so one general area to think about is, is how could Cassandra directly prevent tenants from monopolizing resources in your cluster. So, so one thing is thinking about this percent utilization of, of the read thread pools, um, because that's you know, ultimately the kind of a proxy for the actual resources for, for reading data out of Cassandra. Maybe we could find a way to directly cap what percent of, of the threads in that pool each tenant is able to use either taking table as a proxy for tenant or perhaps building in our usage of a, of a partition key prefix as, as a, uh, a first class citizen in, in Cassandra as some kind of uh, tenant identifier. Another general area, making sure in Cassandra that, that when service does degrade because you, you've saturated your resources, that it does so gracefully. Uh, this is already something that you know, the people working on Cassandra are working to address, but the bottom line is that we don't want the first sign of trouble in Cassandra to be it falling off a cliff because of a long garbage collection pause. It should be you know, a slow, steady degradation of service because that's a big way that one tenant can end up affecting another tenant is if it suddenly causes a 60-second pause in, in one of the JVMs. 
And then finally, although Cassandra publishes lots of, of awesome metrics already that, that I love to spend my time looking at, uh, there could probably be even more. So uh, one thing is maybe more finer grain reporting from the coordinator perspective. Today, you get running total read and write counts and latencies, and you can compute simple averages, but maybe broken down by table or by consistency level, because that's a big driver of the actual expected uh, latency, and maybe get uh, some percentiles instead of just averages to really understand what, what is the end-to-end -end latency being experienced by, by client applications in your cluster. Having seen all the amazing progress in Cassandra since version 0.6, I've no doubt that we're going to continue seeing awesome progress, uh, hopefully in some of these areas, but obviously lots of other ones in 3.0 and beyond. Um, so, so I have faith there. In the meantime, you know, because this is a concern, we, we end up taking a hybrid approach to multi-tenancy. So we use all the techniques that I've discussed here to, to try to use our clusters in a multi-tenant fashion, but in some places, you know, isolation is a strict requirement. So, you know, for select cases, we may still deploy separate clusters. So that wraps up how we're doing our Cassandra multi-tenancy uh, at BlackRock. You know, keep in mind that everyone's situation is, is a bit different. So the things that made sense for us might not make sense for, for other people. But if you're in a situation similar to ours, uh, hopefully this talk gave you a few things to think about. Uh, thank you. You mentioned in your requirements that uh, isolation yeah. of tenants from a performance perspective, you were talking about monitoring them. When you find a tenant that's doing something odd, uh, is your only tool to increase all the tenant's capability? Can you move the tenant? What have you found around that? So it's a challenge today. We take advantage of the fact that, again, these are all running inside our walls. We have, it's not like exposed on the internet or anything. We have control over the actual client processes. So for us, it's a lot more about identification than, than uh, direct control in the cluster. The direct control is really about that, that five minute window between the problem starts and identifying and fixing it, if that makes sense. I, I must have missed it. What do you do though? What, so you found it. You found that one tenant is problematic. From the client side, we'll, we'll slash the utilization from, from whoever's causing the problem. Thank you. Hi. Uh, thanks for a nice presentation. I like the security, custom security solution that I implemented. But there is one area where you are not able to do the isolation, or I'd just like to understand is, creation of the session object. When you're going from your client libraries, just now I attended the Apple lecture, uh, they, they said the creation of connection and the session object is very expensive. So what do you do in your case? Do you share those connection session objects, uh, connection, and connection and session objects per partition, per client, or how do you do? We do, so, so each actual process that's running would just be for, for one client. So maybe I drew the picture too simply, but that top part, that we're not doing that before every time we do the bottom part. Uh, that'll happen once. I just wanted to illustrate it. And then, yeah, we'll save the session object uh, for But the, you're not sharing among the clients, right? Uh, it's being shared. So you want to share it within the context of a JVM. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, we are. Oh, you that. do that. But each JVM would just be running, uh, be running on behalf of one of our client applications. Right. Yeah. So the second level of partitioning is uh, yeah, Cassandra does a lot of background uh, compactions, uh, hints, and all the stuff. Those things you cannot isolate among the clients, right? Yeah. So I would just uh, compaction and hints and everything that can add load and, and maybe on behalf of, of many tenants. Uh, there's not much we can do about that today. Yeah. Uh, you just want to try to size things so that's, you know, multi-tenant or not, those, those aren't causing problems for you. Got it. <laughs> uh, you, in the first part of the talk, you'd mentioned the backup, but given that the multi-tenants may share the same table, how do you do the backup and restore? 
Uh, so we'll back up by, by snapshotting or turning on incremental backups, and then we have an in-house solution that'll scan um, those snapshot files and, and create like a consistent backup file. At the time that we're doing that, we separate it out by, by client. So although each SS table itself will have multiple clients' data in it, the backup files themselves will be at the, at the tenant level, uh, and that's why we use like an, an in-house way of doing that, so, so, we can, uh, okay. so we can separate it like that. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so your data clustering key is a timestamp, and so do you ever hit their uh, per partition key there? They say that it, you shouldn't have more than 100,000. Uh, per partition. Sorry, I had because, a so your data is ever growing because your clustering is timestamp, right? Uh, for a partition, your primary key. Yeah. So in the example, right. yeah, the partition. Right. So do you hit yeah. the limit that data stacks uh, says that per partition you shouldn't have more than hundred thousand, like a wide row, basically? Yeah. That was an example. Don't store prices like that because <laughs> you're gonna you're gonna blow out your partition limit. So yeah. so you do you have something else in your primary key? To, uh, to avoid yeah, that. so you might want to put date, or depending on how how frequently you're getting price updates from the market, you know, choose added an additional time component to the partition key. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that was just an example. <laughs> Have you ever seen a rogue application set up a session with one tenant ID and then start querying with a different tenant ID? Uh we have an outside of misconfigurations in the development or test environment. We're monitoring our, our secure, so we'll log an exception if that happens. Um, I, but I see. So far, it hasn't. <laughs> and with the multi tenant application, you can also have tables that are reference data that would be potentially shared across tenants. All tenants can access them. So, in your model, do you have both where you have we tenant do. specific and? We do. So I was kind of highlighting, you know, what I thought that was the more interesting case. But in some cases, and prices from the market might be one of those, because you know it might be public vendor data. We might not use that approach. We might just store it once for all the clients from the environment we're publishing it from. You write it and then just expose it as read-only, just one copy of the data from from each client. I see. And did I hear correctly, you said range queries cannot be implemented in a multi-tenant fashion? Slices of a partition can, but if you're saying, like, give me all the tokens between, you know, two to the whatever and a gajillion, that, that's not going to work. Or if you're just saying select star from an entire table, that's not going to work. But you can certainly say, get me all the, you know, all BlackRock's prices between 1 o'clock and 2 o'clock, that, that works. Okay. But, but if you're doing table scans, it's probably not a, a very good Cassandra uh, use case anyway. You know. But okay, thank you. I think that's time. Thanks a lot, everyone. <laughs>